Have you ever had a passage from Scripture that really hit you, changed your life, knocked your socks off? Well, this gospel of the rich man and, and poor Lazarus changed the life of a famous uh, Protestant uh, missionary. And when he heard it, uh, he, uh, he just couldn't, he couldn't continue living as he was living, and he wanted to become a medical doctor in the jungles of Africa. Has anybody here, some of you older people have heard of Dr. Albert Schweitzer? You've heard of him? A wonderful Protestant Christian, and, and as a young man, he was a philosopher, he was a theologian, he was a gifted concert pianist, very, very talented, very privileged. And he said, I'm going to enjoy these things until I'm 30 years old. And when I hit 30, I'm going to go to medical school become a doctor, and then eventually go to Africa. And so when he told his family and his friends, they all tried to dissuade him. You would be much more effective if you went around and gave lectures and talks and raised funds for Africa. He would hear none of it. And he, he followed God's inspiration. He spent 47 years. Uh, he died at 90 years old. He was given the Nobel Peace Prize in uh, 1952, Dr. Albert Schweitzer. If he were a Catholic, he would be Saint Albert Schweitzer. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. He just couldn't hear this gospel without giving himself, sharing his gifts uh, with those less fortunate. Now, when you hear the scriptures, they are so powerful. It's all in scripture, folks. The danger of riches, the love of money is, is, is the root of all evil. Beware of greed in all its forms. And so in this, in this parable now, you see the rich man, he has no name. To have no name in the ancient world meant you were nothing. No matter what else you had, he was nameless. And poor Lazarus, at least he had a name, Lazarus meaning God is my help, but it's just so powerful. The rich man dresses in linen and expensive clothing, and he feasts sumptuously. He dines sumptuously every day, and poor Lazarus gets the crumbs. Well, back then they didn't have napkins, okay? They didn't have napkins to wipe their fingers uh, after the meal. They would take a piece of bread, and the, the bread would soak up, soak up the oil, and then the crumbs would fall on the floor. That's what Lazarus got to eat. But see, the thing is, uh, wealth can blind us, can blind us to reality. The rich man saw, he should have seen Lazarus at his doorstep, it said. He was right there, but he walked right by, didn't, didn't notice him. You remember Mother Mary at the wedding at Cana when the young married couple, they ran out of wine and they'd be embarrassed that they had no wine for the reception, for their guests? Who noticed? Mother Mary. She noticed and changed Jesus' entire schedule when he turned the water into wine. The, the rich man didn't notice. He was blinded by his possessions. He was possessed by his possessions. And there's no indication that he kicked Lazarus or ordered the police to arrest him. Nothing like that. He just ignored him. Didn't notice him. Didn't notice him. So it's all through the scriptures, the danger of riches. And maybe you've seen examples where there's a lot of money and then uh, after someone dies, the will and the relatives begin to fight. Watch out. Watch out, the danger of riches. Now, if any parish should know that by God's grace, we can use our possessions 
as God wants them to be used, it should be St. Catherine Drexel. This, that little woman over there, in the 1880s, her father was one of the richest men in the United States, Francis Drexel of Philadelphia. And he died at his desk at the bank at 62 years old. And his wife had died. The fortune goes to his three daughters. And they could have lived a very self-centered life of privilege and luxury. But by God's grace, they didn't. And, and they, they knew. He, he took them. He took his daughters to the Indian reservations out west. And I'm quoting St. Catherine Drexel. We saw the squalor. And then the recently freed slaves now, just after the Civil War, they couldn't read or write. And neither could the Native Americans. They couldn't read or write. And they took the fortune and they founded the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament and they spent that fortune on the most neglected people in our country. They founded, I, can you believe this, that little woman? She founded 145 missions in the United States and Canada. 145. They, they started Xavier University uh, in New Orleans, the first college for black people. Imagine, this is before women could vote. Uh, and, and, and they founded 49 elementary schools, 12 high schools, extraordinary example of having the grace to care and to share. All right? So there's a direct connection. You can see it. There's a direct connection between Christ and the needy, between heaven and those who need help. He told us that when you give someone a cup of water, or food or clothing, you did it for me. There's a direct connection, a direct line. And some uh, preacher said once that when we meet the risen Christ, we need a letter of reference from the poor. We need a letter of reference from the poor. That, yeah, we, we've been good stewards. We've cared and we've shared. When I was first ordained, I was kind of embarrassed that in our church, we always have all of these appeals, all these collections. We're collecting for Haiti, we're collecting for the food pantry, we're collecting for the foreign missions, we're collecting for parishes that can't make it. All of these constant appeals. I don't apologize anymore. I don't apologize anymore for that. That's what we're supposed to be doing, folks. There's a direct line where Christ tells us that we're supposed to care and share and notice. And I want to thank our deacons. You know, the deacons, Deacon Charlie and Deacon Rick, from the beginning of the church, they were to care for the orphans and the widows. They controlled the money, the charity account. I was supposed to pray. I'm not kidding you. It's in the scriptures. I'm supposed to do the praying and all of that, but they're supposed to do the work of charity. And we are so blessed with the deacons that we have and with Chris Conley in, in preparation. And, and our charity account, I'm telling you, they know by name all of the different towns, all of the different welfare agents, and they work together. Uh, and it's all confidential. What they do, the names are all confidential but they're really reaching out and helping people in many of the towns around us, many of, many of the towns. I'll give one example. We had a person who died with nothing, couldn't pay for the funeral. The town said, well, we'll pay for half, and the charity account, you paid for the other half. That's what we're supposed to be doing, folks. That's what, and, and the coat rack, I can't tell you the amount of clothing that goes out from there, the amount of clothing that's bought. Uh, extraordinary. The teenagers, their feet are this big, folks. They have to buy shoes. You wouldn't believe it. The, the, oh, yeah, size 12 uh, wide. But all of those things are going on, and I don't apologize for it. We're supposed to be doing that. And I am so grateful. I'm so grateful that we have this Saint Catherine Drexel who had a fortune and showed us how to follow Christ.
and Dr. Albert Schweitzer, that great, that great uh, Nobel Peace Prize uh, recipient. Now, some good friends of mine are here this morning, the, the Coverts, Kate and Joe Covert, and their whole family is here in the front row. Stephen and Brendan and Dan and Lydia, they're all here. Uh, when I was in Dover, I was there for 10 wonderful years, and uh, Dover, you know, was founded three years after Plymouth by Puritans. They came up, and they founded Portsmouth, and they founded Dover. Uh, so it's a very old community, and uh, I, I renewed their vows on their 25th anniversary in their living room, in their living room. So you're back today for the 40th, and I think we should book the 50th. I think we should book that. All right, so why don't you come up here? And uh, these people are very active uh, in, in, in the church in Dover, the Church of the Assumption, all right, with Father Aggie Jean. All right, I'm going to have you turn and face each other, look each other in the eyes, and if you could repeat after me, I'm going to begin with you, Joe. I, Joseph, reaffirm my marriage vows and rededicate myself in the same spirit that I promised when I took you, Catherine, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, until death do us part. I, Catherine, reaffirm my marriage vows and rededicate myself in the spirit, in the same spirit that I pronounced when I took you, Joseph, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, until death do us part. Our Lord continues to bless your sacrament of matrimony. May he grant you many more happy years together, and may your witness of love reach out not only to your family and friends, but to the entire community. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Congratulations. Good. Gosh, you look you look the same as you did. Yeah, you do. Well, that's beautiful. So let's continue now, and we should celebrate. We should celebrate those things. Those are so important to celebrate. Let's continue now with the profession of our faith. So we'll pray the Apostles' Creed now. I also mentioned today is the feast day of the Archangels, Michael. Gabriel and Raphael, the Archangels, the Apostles' Creed. 